So the title of the lesson this morning is that people are special. People are very special. So I would like us to think about the dignity, the honor, the worth, the value of human life. And I just wish this, this understanding of the value of human life could sweep across our country, sweep across the world. Because if we can all get a hold of the value, the meaning, the honor, the dignity of human life, it would certainly affect the way we see each other, the way we see other people, and how we treat other people. So I'd like this to be our focus this morning for our Bible lesson. And let me start off by saying we possess immeasurable worth before God. We have such great value before God that it is unable to be measured. It's immeasurable. We have great honor, great dignity. And this worth, this value that we have before God is not based on the color of our skin. It's not based on how much money we have or don't have. It's not based on our intelligence, or how smart we are, or whether we went to college, or whether we have a high-paying job, or whether we have a, a real high IQ or not so high IQ. Our value, our worth, our honor, our dignity before God is immeasurable, and it is not based on any of these things. It's an inherent, intrinsic worth that God has given to us just by virtue of the fact that God has made us human beings, and he made us human beings very special unlike anything else on earth, unlike the animal kingdom, unlike the plant kingdom, we possess special worth. So let's start this morning. I have about five points here. So let's start with number one. If you want and you have your Bibles, feel free to follow along. So let's go to Genesis chapter one, if you will. Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one. So here we start right at the very beginning of the Bible, right at the very beginning of God's special revelation to us. And God says something very profound about human beings. And so we want to look at this this morning. So this is Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Genesis 1, verse 26. So here we read in God's word, Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then if you will note verse 31. So God looked at all this. What did God say? Verse 31. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So there we read that us human beings were created in the image and the likeness of God. In other words, we humans bear some resemblance to God. And so we want to just think about this for a moment. It's hard to identify exactly what is meant when we're told we are created in the image and the likeness of God. So what is it about us that's like God? Let me just say by, start by saying as we think about this, well, we're not omnipotent like God. We don't have all power. We're not omniscient like God. We don't know everything like God. And we're certainly not everywhere present. We can't be everywhere present. Yet the whole universe is in God's presence, and God is everywhere present. So we're not like God in any of these ways. But I think it's in regard to personhood. God is a person. He possesses personality. We possess personality. We are persons. And we have been endowed by our creator with a special ability to think. We have special intelligence. We have the ability to reason and to analyze things. We have a, a profound capacity for memory. And we also have emotions. We can get angry. We can be happy. We can be sad. We have all these uh, different emotions. And we also have the power to choose. We have a will. We can, we can choose to do things. We can choose not to do things. We think things through. So I believe this is part of our being created in the image and likeness of God. God is a person and we're a person. 
Now, if you think about the animal kingdom, if you take this, what might be deemed the smartest animal on earth that we know of, and I don't know what that would be. I don't know what the smartest animal is, but whatever you, whatever you deem the smartest animal to be, that animal nonetheless primarily operates on instinct. We are far, far, way, way above the smartest animal on earth. Uh, did you ever see an animal sit down and play the piano? Play some Mozart? No, I don't think so. Uh, did you ever see an animal write a book? I don't think so. Did you ever see animals uh, get together and have a sort of a team meeting down at the NASA Space Center and figure out how we're going to put man on the moon? I don't think so. So I think you get the point. Uh, human beings are very special. We've been created in the image and likeness of God, and we have been down with personality, this ability to, to think, to reason, to have memory, to have extraordinary intelligence, to have emotions, to, to have the ability to choose. And I believe God created us this way so that we might know him and be able to relate to him. Animals can't relate to God the way that we know God and can relate to God. Sure, animals and every, every living thing that God has made in a way declares its maker's praise. Everything exists to bring glory to God. But we humans are very, very special. We've been created in God's image and likeness for the purpose of knowing God, using our reason, using our minds to, to seek God, to get to know God and then to continue to relate to him in obedience and in worship. If you're there in Genesis, notice chapter 9. Just before we go on, let's notice Genesis chapter 9. It's repeated here. Genesis chapter 9. So just flip the page to Genesis 9, and then notice what it says there in Genesis 9. I'll begin in verse 5. Surely, for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Now verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. So there again it's repeated. God made us in his image. We, we alone, bear some resemblance to God. God puts something of himself in us, some likeness of himself in us. And I, I believe I don't have a full answer to this. I don't understand it completely, but I think it relates to our personhood. We're very, very special. We're persons. God is a person. We are persons. All right, let's move on to number two. Number two. Line this up a little bit. People are made for God. We have been made for God. So think about that. Yes, you could argue that everything that has been created has been made to bring glory to God. We look at the plants and we say, wow, God is a great and awesome creator. Uh, you can look at every, all, all the animals, all the various uh, species of animals and all their special instincts that God has given and say, wow. They show the greatness of God and how good he is. But I believe we, we were made for God in a very special way. There's something about humans that have been made for God. So keep that in mind as, as we walk down the street and see people. Keep in mind, every person has been made in the image and the likeness of God and possesses immeasurable worth. Keep in mind, as you look at people, people all over the world, people of every, every race, every language, every economic background, they have all been created for God. All right, let's start in Acts. If you will, go to the New Testament, and let's start in Acts. So let's go to the New Testament, go past the Gospels, and we come to Acts. Acts 17. I think many of you recognize this passage as the passage where Paul preaches in Athens. Paul went into Athens, and he couldn't help but notice and be struck by the by the many pagan temples and pagan shrines all throughout the, the city. And he observed that they were a very religious and a very superstitious people. But notice what uh, Luke writes as he, as he speaks here. This is uh, Acts 17, and let's begin in verse 23. Acts 17, verse 23. So uh, Paul says here, For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, 
And here Paul speaking to the Areopagus, a gathering of uh, the Athenians, uh, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. And now Paul preaches God to these people at Athens. In verse 24, he says, God, who made the world and everything in it. So that would include us. God made us. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. So that would certainly include us. God gives to us humans life, breath, and all things necessary for our sustenance. So right there, we possess great worth, great honor. God made us, he sustains us. Now verse 26. And he, God, has made from one blood every nation to dwell of men, of people to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitations, so that, here's the purpose now, why did God create human beings? Why has God put them on earth? Why does God sustain them? What, what is God up to? What is God's big plan? Notice verse 27. So that they, human beings, that they, people, should do what? They should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Uh, verse 28. For in him we live, we move, and have our being uh, we all, uh, as also some of your own poets have said, we are also his offspring. Therefore, verse 29, therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now God commands all men, all people, all human beings everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has appointed or ordained, uh, he has given assurance uh, of this to all by raising him from the dead. So I'll just end the reading right there. So God has created us. He's put it on the earth so that we will try to seek for God, that we will sort of grope for God. The, the imagery there is uh, uh, sort of uh, being in a dark room, trying to feel a way around a dark room, trying to find something. Maybe you're in a dark room. You came in and you're groping in the dark. You're trying to find the light switch. Well, that's what God says of human beings. That's what Paul says as he speaks to these uh, Athenians, uh, as they are pagans. They don't know God. And the purpose of God is that these people would come to know him and uh, embrace Jesus as their Savior since God has raised him from the dead. All right, let's go to Romans 11, 36. Moving right along here, Romans 11, 36. So just go over to Romans. Under each point, I did put the uh, references in order. So Romans 11, verse 36. And here we have a little statement about God that we often overlook. Sometimes the, the short little statements in the Bible are very powerful, especially as they speak about God's greatness. So we get down to Romans 11, verse 36. We come to the end of this section of chapters 9, 10, and 11. And throughout this section, Paul speaks so much of God's mercy, how God has uh, no doubt been... Uh, very gracious to his chosen people. They harden their hearts, and then God has flung the door of mercy wide open to the Gentiles so that they could become uh, believers in, in, in God, believers in Christ. So we get down to verse uh, 36, uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 36, and Paul says, For of him, that's of God, and through him, that's through God, and to him, or in other words, to God, are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. So all creation, everything that's been made, has come from God. All things are of God or out of God. God is the source of all things. And then the verse says all things are through God. In other words, God is the one sustaining all things. He keeps all things. And then all things are to God. Everything has been created, everything has been made to God, or it's going to God, it's towards God, or it's for God, if I could use that preposition. It's for God. So everything has been made by God, everything comes from God, everything is being sustained, sustained and nurtured by God, and everything is to God or for God, and that includes us human beings. We have come from God, we're being sustained by God, and we are to God or for God. If you will, go over to 1 Corinthians 8, if you will. 1 Corinthians 8. You just go to the next book in your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 
and we want to notice uh, starting in verse 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 5. Uh, here Paul is addressing the issue of uh, eating meat that's been sacrificed to idols. Uh, some Christians, uh, out of conscience, did not feel they could eat meat sacrificed to idols. Uh, some did. But Paul has a few words to say here. I just want to focus in this section. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. And Paul says here, For Even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us, and what he means by that is for us Christians, for us believers, there is only one God. And then notice how Paul describes this one God. For us Christians, there is only one God, the Father, of whom are all things. And we, notice the next words, and we for him. God is the creator of all things. God is the source of all things. All things have come from God. God made everything, and we, we people, we human beings are for God. We were created for him. So we have a special purpose and a special meaning. Uh, then Paul goes on to say, not only we were created for him, and there is one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things. Just like God the Father, Jesus Christ created all things. All things have been made by Jesus Christ. And through him we live. Jesus is also the sustainer of all things. All right, one more reference here for this point. Let's go to Colossians, if you will. Colossians 1.16. Just past uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. We come to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. Hey, here the Apostle Paul is speaking, speaking about the exaltedness of Jesus, the supremacy, the greatness of Jesus. And we read here in Colossians 1 verse 16, For by him, that is by Jesus Christ, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him. And for him, we were created for Jesus Christ, just as we were created for God. So I believe this is why humans possess great worth. Not only were we created by God and created in God's image and likeness, but we also were created for God. We were created for him. That makes us very special. All right, let's go down to number three. Number three. We are valued by God. Let me just put it right there. In fact, I'll slide this up a little bit if you want. Just leave it right there. Number three, we are valued by God. We possess great value. And of course, we read earlier, you don't need to turn back there, but we read earlier from Psalm 139. And David was musing on how God has great knowledge of everything. God knows everything about him. And David was even musing on the fact that God knew all about him, even while he was unborn, while he was still developing as a baby in his mother's womb. And you recall there in Psalm 139, David said, Lord, you have formed my inward parts. You have covered me in my mother's womb. Even in the darkness of his mother's womb, God saw everything that was going on. God was interested in looking at David developing and forming in his mother's womb. And David says there, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. In other words, I'm just, I'm, I've been made in an extraordinary way. Marvelous are your works. And David understands that he's one of the special works of God. In verse uh, 16 there, uh, David says, your eyes, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed or incomplete. And in your book they were all written. So yes, God has special delight in David and God has special delight in looking at the formation of a baby in its mother's womb. If we go to Matthew, let's go to the New Testament. Let's all go to Matthew, if you will. Matthew 6. Matthew 6. Jesus here specifically says we have more value than animals. So I want you to know that. We have some people today that think, well, we're just animals. We're just, you know, the highest form of animals. We're, we're, we're just a, a more developed animal. Uh, but I don't like to think of us that way. So if you're there in Matthew 6, 
Uh, what do we have down here? Matthew 6, verse 26. Matthew 6, verse 26. Jesus is trying to teach his disciples not to worry. So this is what he says in Matthew 6, 26. Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Your heavenly Father takes care of them. Your heavenly Father provides for them. God even cares for the birds. And then notice the question that Jesus puts to his disciples. Are you not of more value than they? And the implied answer is, oh yes, yes, yes indeed. We have more value than the birds of the air. We have more value than animals. And then if you go over to Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10, we have a similar passage here. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 29. Matthew 10 and verse 29. The last reference there under number 3. Uh, Matthew 10 and verse 29. Again, Jesus speaking here. And Jesus says, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? That would be a very little amount of money. And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. Wow, that's pretty amazing. But the very hairs of your head are numbered, all numbered. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore you are of more value than many sparrows. You have more value than many animals. And God says there, or Jesus says that God even has all our heads numbered. That's pretty amazing. I have no idea how many hairs I have on my head. I have no idea how to count them. I'm not sure it really matters a whole lot to me. I'm just thankful I still have hair. <laughs> Praise God. And it's still pretty red or brown now, but still has some color to it. So I'm thankful. But just notice that God knows us so well. He's so so intimately acquainted with us. He's so interested in us. He cares for us so much so, he knows every detail of our life, that he has all the hairs of my head. They're all numbered. Like this one is number one, this one's number two, that's number three, so on and so forth. Wow, that's pretty amazing. And then Jesus says, listen, don't fear, don't worry, look it. God cares for the animal kingdom. He takes care of the birds. He provides for them so that they are sustained. God cares a whole lot more for us. If God cares for the birds of the air, if he cares for the sparrows, he certainly values us and he cares for us much more so. So certainly Jesus teaches that to God, humans are very special and very valuable. All right, let's get down to number four here. Let me just slide this over a little bit so we can see that. All right, number four. Let me just straighten that out. I don't like things to be crooked. All right. So let's think about human beings now. We've been created in the image and likeness of God. We've been created for God. We have special value. We're certainly worth a lot more. We have more value and honor and dignity than the animals. So number four, people are the objects of God's love and grace in Christ Jesus. Or to put this more bluntly and blatantly, Christ didn't come to save vegetation. He didn't come to save plants. He didn't come to save animals even though I believe in the, the future kingdom of Christ on earth, there'll be some, some change in, in the plants and the animals. We know, we know from Isaiah that the lion and the lamb will be able to lie down together and there'll be peace, even in the animal kingdom. But God sent his son Jesus into the world to save us human beings. God is interested in our salvation. He's interested in, in bringing us into a, a very special and right relationship with him. I mean, that's why we were created in the image and the likeness of God in the first place. So that makes humans very special. In other words, human beings are savable. Every human being is savable. It doesn't mean every human being will be saved. It doesn't mean every human being will come to Christ. But that's God's desire, that humans exercise their volition and the power of choice. They exercise uh, what it is that makes them a person so that they will seek God and come to know God. So let's look at some of these references here. We all know John 3.16. Right? For God so loved the what world. He loved the world of people. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So that's a great verse that underscores that human beings are special before God. Uh, he, he loves humans so much that he sent his son 
the son of his everlasting love, his eternal son, the son of his eternal love, into the sin-sick world and allow his son to be crucified, to be executed, to be nailed to a cross, to be despised and rejected by human beings. He loved the world so much so that Jesus uh, was willing to do that and he was sent by God the Father. All right, well, I think most of us know Romans, uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we people were sinners, while we were far away from God, alienated from God, weak and God's enemies, Christ died for us. He died for us, what, human beings. He died for us people. Text doesn't say he died for plants. It doesn't say he died for animals. He died for people. People are special. We have special honor and special dignity. All right, now let's go in our Bibles. Let's turn in our Bibles now to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. We go past uh, Colossians, 1 2 Thessalonians. We come to 1 Timothy. Let's see if I have the right reference here. 1 Timothy. should be chapter 2. Sorry, I made a mistake. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I made a little mistake there in that reference. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And I made another mistake on number four. It should say people are the object of God's, should be possessive, God's love and grace in Christ. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so just catch that one. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Notice verse 3. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Notice that God has called our Savior, the Savior of people. Verse 4, who desires all men, or all people. That word men there doesn't just mean males as opposed to females. Men is deemed in a generic sense. It means all people. Uh, for their, uh, who desires, verse 4, God who desires all men, all people to be saved. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. One mediator between God and human beings. One mediator between God and people. The man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So as we read that, we understand people are special. God wants us people to be saved, to be delivered from our sins, to be forgiven, and to be reconciled to our maker. That's God's plan and purpose for people. And then, uh, let's see, I have 410. Just flip the page, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. He's the Savior of all people. He's the Savior of all human beings, especially of those who believe. So all human beings are savable. They're able to be saved. The gospel, the good news of Christ goes out and is for all people. But only those who believe actually believe become Christians, they receive the forgiveness of sins, they reconcile to God, and they have the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that makes people very special. We are the objects of God the Father's love, we are the objects of Christ's love and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. This, this special gift of salvation was intended for people so that we could come to know God and fulfill the very purpose for which we were created in the image and in the likeness of God. One more reference, if you're there, just go over to Titus, or just go past 2 Timothy, and we're in Titus. Uh, Titus chapter 2, just another reference here. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It's for all men. God's grace has appeared to and it brings salvation to all men. It's there. Salvation is for all people. And not all people will be saved unless, unless they believe in Jesus as their Savior. They won't be saved. But the gift is there for people, for human beings. All right, let's go to my last point on the outline. Number five. Let me just slide this up a little bit. You can all see that right there. I'll just leave it right there. So people are made and saved to show God's glory. So that makes people very special. Yes, you could argue, you could argue that, you know, plants in some ways show God's glory, that, you know, the animals show God's glory. You could argue that everything shows God's glory in a sense, but we were created to show God's glory in a special way. 
And God has orchestrated our redemption, our salvation through Christ, so that we will show off God's glory, God's grace, and God's goodness in a very special way that will not be showed off by other elements or aspects of creation. Uh, you don't need to turn there, but in Isaiah, I'll cover the Isaiah passage, but back in Isaiah chapter 6, remember Uzziah has this vision. He sees God Almighty in his temple high and lifted up, and the, the, robe, the robe of his train just fills the temple. And then we have an angelic declaration there in Isaiah 6, verse 3. And one angel cried to another angel and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of God's glory. The whole earth is full from the plants and the animals to the sky and sea and the water cycle, everything declares God's glory. And that includes us. We're part of what's on earth. The whole earth, including humans, is intended to show and to reveal God's glory. But I believe we human beings are intended to show God's glory in a very special way. And God has a special plan for us to show his glory in an extraordinary way. So if you will, let's go to the next reference, Romans 8. Romans 8, and we'll just finish up with a few New Testament references here. Romans chapter 8. So just before we read Romans chapter 8, we all know, I think, what Romans 3.23 says. For all have sinned, what? All have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. So keep that, I want you to just kind of keep that in mind as, as background before we read Romans 8. So back in Romans 3, verse 23, Paul writes and says, For all have sinned. All human beings have sinned. We're talking about human beings now. We're not talking about plants or animals. We're talking about human beings. All human beings have sinned. And we're all coming short. We all come short of the glory of God in Romans 3, 23. So that means our lives don't show God's glory as they should. Our lives don't show the glory of God in view of God's greatness and the, and, and the glory that he actually possesses. Our lives are not glorifying God, if I could put it that way. Our lives just don't glorify God as they should. Why? Because we've been marred by sin. We're fallen creatures. Back in chapter 5, Paul says we're weak. We're sinners. Uh, we're enemies. Uh, so that's who we are. All have sinned and all come short of the glory of God. So what is God up to? God is trying to make us glorify God. God is trying to reshape us, change us, transform us, so that we don't come short of the glory of God. We actually show and exude the glory of God in a manner worthy of God. So with that background in mind, now notice Romans 8, verse 18. We get now to this great passage uh, where God is working out his salvation for us. And in Romans 8, verse 18, the apostle Paul writes and says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, us human beings, us people. Yes, us people who are believers in Christ, but we're people. God is working to show his glory in an extraordinary way in and through people, his redeemed people. I just find that so amazing. Oftentimes we read verses that speak about people in the Bible or persons or humans. We just gloss over them. We don't, we don't really think about that, the specialness of people. Then notice verse 30. If you're there in Romans 8, uh, notice verse 30. Romans 8, verse 30. Paul writes and says, Moreover, whom God predestined, these he also called. In other words, he called us to himself through the gospel. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also what? Glorified. God is going to glorify people. People who trust in his son, Jesus. God loves all those who love his son. And we will exude a special glory worked out by God at the second coming of Christ. All right, let's just go to the Ephesians passages. We'll wrap it up with Ephesians. So if you just go over to Ephesians, human beings have been designed by God and have been designed by his plan of redemption to show, to exude, to reveal, to display in a very special way God's awesome glory, God's goodness, and God's grace. That is not said of plants or animals. It is said of us humans who have been created in the image and in the likeness of God. All right, if you're there in Ephesians 1, we'll just notice a few verses here. 
just to sort of emphasize how we have been created for God and we have been saved by God, by Jesus Christ, to bring glory, to bring honor, to show something of God's marvelousness to all other beings in the universe. All right, Ephesians 1, verse 5. Uh, we human beings who have been saved, we human beings who are Christians, we Christians, we believers, we, it says there, having been predestined us, God has predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, verse 6 now, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. He's made us accepted before him in the merits of the beloved one, Jesus Christ, our Savior. So in other words, there in verse 6, we have been saved to the praise, to the honor of the glory of his grace. We've been saved to just show off how glorious and wonderful is God's grace and goodness towards us in Christ Jesus. All right, look at verse 14. Verse 14. Uh, it comes up again here in verse 14. Uh, speaking of the Holy Spirit there in verse 14, the Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the what? To the praise of his glory. We're considered a purchased possession. And we're not fully redeemed yet. Christ is coming at the second advent of Christ. These dead bodies that would die before Christ comes, these dead bodies will be raised. And God will show off his grace even more then. And then if you just look over at chapter 2, I just want to end on a note where God is going to use us human beings who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ to show off his goodness forever and ever and ever and ever in an extraordinary way. So notice verse 7. God's great purpose in being raised up together with Christ and being situated together, sitting together, seated together in the heavenly places in Christ. Now chapter 2, verse 7. Here's the great purpose of God. That in the ages to come, God might show, God might demonstrate, God might reveal the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us people, us humans, us Christians, us people who have been saved, us, us uh, humans who have believed in Jesus. He might show his kindness, his goodness toward us in Christ Jesus. As we are associated with Christ, as we are united with Christ through faith, God is going to spend all eternity showing off his goodness. He's going to use us. He's going to use people, human beings, to show off his wonderful glory and his extraordinary grace. So I've said all of this this morning so that we might remind ourselves once again. I'll leave that there. Some are still writing down verses. But I just want us to remind ourselves that we're special. All people are special. So when we look at other people, and I know we live in a society where, you know, people do a lot of bad things. There's a lot of crime. There's murders. There's rape. There's drug use and abuse. And drug dealers, and, and it just seems like the crime is terrible. But we humans, we, we, we end up destroying ourselves through sin. But we're special. God made us. God loves us. God cares about people, and he wants all people everywhere to repent and come to know God through Christ. So as we look at people, let's realize that people are special. You're special. You're a person. Uh, you're one of the uh, persons that God has created in his own image and his own likeness. And God has brought his salvation to you. And God has an extraordinary delight in us people. But also God has an extraordinary delight. A very special joy and delight in us Christians. Because we have believed in Jesus as the Son of God and as our Savior from sin. So let's pray. <clears throat> Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to, to just meditate on these passages. Lord, use these passages to uplift all of us. Help us to realize that just by virtue of being created by you, we possess immeasurable worth, immeasurable value. And then, Lord, you love us and you, and you care about us. And you have a special joy and delight in us because you've worked through your spirit. And you've worked through the gospel to bring us to Christ. And we have acknowledged your son. We believe in your son. We honor your son. And you have a special joy in us people who are believers, Lord. So Lord, help us to love people. Help us to have a compassion on people. I know people can irritate us. They can annoy us. But Lord, help us to have a, a, a special joy in people because we represent the crowning glory of your creation created for you in a very special way, Lord. Transform our society, Lord. I pray that more and more people in our country and around the world would see people as you see them and see them in light of the purposes for which you have made us 
people. May your name be honored and glorified through this Bible lesson this morning. We pray this all in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.